Welcome back, everybody, <laughs> to Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. My name is Daniel Rogers, and yeah, you know the drill. We're doing a podcast today. It's been a while since we've done one. I think the last podcast we did was with Tiffany Yecky Brooks back a few months ago to talk about her brand new book, Holy Ghosted, which I hope you were able to pick that book up and enjoy it as I did. Uh, I've got some exciting things to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about the state of the podcast. We're going to talk about Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace, episode two of season one, this being season one, episode one. We're going to talk about what guests we've already co- recorded episodes with and what guests we have on the calendar to record episodes with. And then we're going to talk about the foreknowledge of God, free will, and determinism. So yeah, uh, hang on because this is going to be a fun one. So let's talk about the state of the podcast. Obviously, I don't post a lot. Uh, I post a lot on my Substack weekly, actually, uh, sometimes twice a week, but usually once a week. That's danielcrogers.substack.com. It is free to subscribe. All the posts, in fact, are free. Uh, Paid subscribers get the posts a week early that aren't, aren't, uh, you know, sermon posts. But basically, you can listen to my sermons there. You can read my sermon manuscripts kind of sermon manuscripts. You can read other articles and things on there. I've written about uh, Jesus' death and atonement theory recently. I've written, written about thin places, women's roles in the church, et cetera, et cetera, all on my substack, danielcrogers.substack.com. But I haven't posted much here. Why not? Uh, there are some reasons that I can't talk about openly on uh, the old podcast here of why I haven't been posting. Uh, but the main ones and the actual ones are, it takes a lot of time. You know, this is a lot of work to get guests, uh, to record the episodes, to find a time where everybody can get together, to edit the episodes. If there's video, to put the video in the right place and put it all together and publish it and make it look pretty and nice and make the sound good and everything. Like, it's it's a lot of work. You might not think it is, but it's, it's actually a lot of work, especially when you have two kids under the age of five and you are working at a church full time and your wife is a full time school teacher and you have all of the youth group stuff and summer activities and everything to keep up keep up with. Yeah. Well, oh, it's a lot of work. But here we are. So that's why I haven't been posting that much, uh the main reasons I suppose. The other thing I want to tell you though is I have help. Yes, I now have help. Kyler Burke. He is uh active in the Facebook group, Exploring Faith Pursuing Grace Facebook group. He is in public relations, uh, and he has agreed to volunteer to help me get guests. He reaches out to them. He navigates their contact forms on the websites for me. Uh, He sends them a link through which they can schedule episodes, uh, recording times with me. And he actually has already secured uh, three different people to do interviews with. We've already recorded two of those interviews um, with Cheryl Bridges Johns on her book, Reenchanting the Text. We're going to talk about uh, embodied worship in that episode. We talk about how to interpret the Bible. We talk about the word-only approach to the Spirit and the Spirit-only approach to the Word, and a couple of other things that I think you'll find interesting. And the other interview I did was with Brian McLaren. Also, by the way, thanks to Kyler for getting that one set up. And we talked about his new book, uh... What's his new book called? Hang on a second. Life After Doom. (laughs) And so we talked about how hope and despair can both paralyze us uh, from doing any kind of action, uh, a certain kind of hope and a certain kind of despair. We talked about, uh, you know, the end of planet Earth and all that fun stuff. I think you'll enjoy that. It's called Life After Doom. And then I'm going to be doing an episode with Jared Bias. And actually, Kyler is going to hop on there and co-host that with me since he's the one who... I really wanted to get Jared on Jared on, and get that set up. He's going to come help me out. Yeah, that's going to be uh, later in the year towards the end of August. But this is season one of Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. Yes, we have done a hundred or so episodes up to this point, but they've been just kind of uh, on some sort of schedule, whether it was every week, whether it was every other week, whether it was uh, once every six months. But now, now here we are with a new season. Episodes every week. For 13, yes, for 13 weeks. This is episode one, and we're going to go through episode 13. Sometimes there'll be a guest, sometimes it'll be me talking, sometimes it'll be Kyler and myself talking. And I'm going to bring some other people on as well to help me interview some folks uh, on down the road, at least if they respond to our emails. 
But if you have someone you would like for us to talk to, uh, you can message me, you can message Kyler, and we'll get that set up. So that's what's happening. It's going to be good. All right. Today we're going to be talking about 1 Samuel chapter 23. So go ahead, and I've got my Bible here. If you got your Bible, you can uh, open it up, you can scroll to it, or you can just listen if you're driving. So buckle up, 1 Samuel 23, and we're going to talk about God's foreknowledge and whether or not uh, we have free will. Yeah, so the question about uh, free will really... So before we jump into uh, 1 Samuel 23... Um, I want to talk about why we're talking about this. All right. So there's this idea uh, within certain groups of Christians that if God foreknows something, then it is going to happen. Like, for example, the Calvinists might argue from like a predestination standpoint that God foreknows everything that you're going to do in your life. Therefore, whether or not you are a believer or whether or not you are not a believer, is predetermined, right? Since God knows everything from the beginning, then your entire life is predetermined and foreknown, and you don't really have any free will because you can't go against the will of God. Like, you're already going to do whatever it is that you're going to do, and there's nothing that could stop that or change it or morph it or whatever. People that are lost are going to be lost. People that are saved are going to be saved, and that's about it. There's uh, There's another perspective, though, which argues something... Similar, but from from the, the other the other angle, and that is uh, that God doesn't know everything there is to know about the future. That God has basically uh, selectively known certain things, like prophetic things, uh, you know, end time stuff, life of Jesus, that kind of thing. But that God doesn't know everything about everything that you're going to do, and so your uh, decisions are your decisions. Your your will is your will, right? Here's the thing, though. Um, I think the assumption here is false. Uh, God knowing the outcome doesn't mean uh, that you have no free will. L- let me let me just show you what I mean in the Bible, First Samuel 23. Because I know this is a question that a lot of people have problems with. Uh, a lot of people struggle with this idea about free will and do we have free will and whatnot. But I think 1 Samuel 23 offers a good perspective on this. Uh, By the way, I've listened to the audiobook of this passage like four times before starting this podcast, and I can almost guarantee that I'm going to mispronounce the name. So, just letting you know. 1 Samuel 23, verse 1. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, they told David, the Philistines are fighting against Kaliah and are robbing the threshing floors. David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Kaliah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Kaliah against the armies of the Philistines? Oh, by the way, at this point in time, uh, basically David's on the run from Saul. And Saul is most likely going to kill David if he catches him. So so, uh, David's men are a little bit afraid. So first off, by the way, David asks God, Hey, can I go and save these people from the Philistines? And God says, go do it. And now David's men say, no, we can't do that. We're scared. And so uh, David asks again in verse 2, and the Lord says, yes, go down to Kaliah, for I'll give the Philistines into your hand. So they has like double confirmation, right? So God foreknows that the Philistines are going to fall to David, and David is going to be victorious. So David and his men went to Kaliah, fought with the Philistines, brought away their livestock, and dealt them a heavy defeat. Thus David rescued the inhabitants of Kaliah. When Abiathar, the son of Elimelech, I always like that name, and I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing it, uh, but there's also like a similar name in Ruth, and I always think about like the Lion King, you know? Elimelech, 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 Elimelech. Anyways, when he fled to David at Kaliah, he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Kaliah, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand. Now notice... It was told Saul that David had come to Kaliah, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Saul summoned all the people to war, to go down to Kaliah to besiege David and his men. When David learned that Saul was plotting evil against him, he said to the priest, Abiathar, bring the ephod here. David said, 
O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has heard that Saul seeks to come to Kaliah to destroy the city on my account. And now will uh, now will Saul come down as your servant has heard? And O Lord, the God of Israel, I beseech you, tell your servant. The Lord says, he will come down. Now put the brakes on right there. Knowing what you know about Bible prophecy, knowing what you know about the God's foreknowledge, assuming what you assume about how God works, is Saul going to come down or is he not? Yes, you are correct. God, uh, Saul is coming down no matter what. God has foreseen it. David has confirmed it through prophecy. It is not going to be pretty because Saul has summoned all the people to war. David's men's fears seem to be coming true. So, verse 12, David wants to know. All right, I just saved all these people. Okay, Will the men of Goliath surrender me and my men to the hand of Saul? The Lord said, they will surrender you. Question for you again. <clears throat> is David toast? Is David toast? <laughs> I think if we learned anything from the first prophecies, right? Uh, God says twice, I will deliver the Philistines to your hand. We know that that's, that's, that's going to happen, right? David's going to go. David acts upon that foreknowledge of God. He wins the day, right? So knowing what we know about that situation, we can read this second situation that, yes, Saul is going to come to get you, and yes, the men of Kaliah, even though you just saved their lives, are going to turn you over to Saul because there are 600 of you and a million of them, and there's no way you would ever win that fight. Right? And so that's what God says. They will surrender you. So what happens? Does, is David now a sitting duck? Is David just done for? Then David said, rather, David and his men, who were about 600, set out and left Kaliah. They wandered wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kaliah, he gave up the expedition. <laughs> so, <coughs> did God's foreknowledge fail? Was God wrong? Because Saul didn't come to Kaliah to take David. But, but God said that he would. He answered David and he said, yes, he is on his way. Or what about this other, about the men giving him up? That didn't happen. Did God's foreknowledge fail? And here's the interesting thing, it seems to me, about God's foreknowledge. Uh, you know how, like, in uh, quantum physics, that the particle travels every possible path until it gets, you know, until you observe it, then it picks one and sticks to it? You ever seen that experiment done? I think you can watch some with a flashlight on YouTube. It's pretty cool. You can go look that up. Uh, but anyways, the... The situation seems to be that God sees all of the outcomes. And so it's almost as if God is saying, okay, in the current situation, with you being here, Saul is going to come. But then when David makes the decision using the foreknowledge to leave, now the situation changes, and now he's not going to come. It's not that God's prophecy or foreknowledge or whatever you want to call it failed. It's that David used knowledge of what would happen in that current circumstance to change the circumstance, which led to the thing no longer happening. It's like, if you want to think about it in the terms of Marvel or whatever, in one parallel universe, David elects to stay and fight it out. In another one, he leaves. <laughs> and both are true. And both would be true until David makes the decision to leave. Saul was on his way until David saw, uh, saw what was going to happen and said, okay, man, let's get out of here. These people are going to turn us over. It's no good for us here. Let's move on to the next expedition or whatever. Now think about this from in terms of like uh, our own personal individual salvation, which is a very limited way of looking at salvation, but that's what we're all familiar with. So let's just look at it that way. God says this and this and this and this you do, you be saved. This and this and this you do not do, you will be damned. Whatever. It's not that. It's not that the uh, total outcome that God's knowledge of every possible path dictates which one you're going to choose. You have the ability yourself to look at the situation and go, okay, if I continue this way down the broad path that leads to destruction, that's not going to be great for me. But if I go down this way towards the narrow way that leads to life, that'll be good for me. So I think I'm going to choose uh, the narrow way that leads to life. And a lot of people have this information. And they have the freedom to act upon this information as they would, just as David would look at the information provided to him by God and decided to first go save the people of Kaliah, but on the second hand, to go and escape the city so that Saul would not come and destroy him with his armies. You see, 
God's foreknowledge didn't fail. It's just that David chose to act on the foreknowledge, which brought about a different circumstance, which changed you know, the, the series of events, the dominoes as they would fall on down the road. Think about this in terms of the prophecies given by the prophets in Scripture. Right, because the prophecies come and they preach doom and gloom. You guys are going to get destroyed. You guys are going to get wiped off the face of the earth, taken into exile, whatever, whatever, whatever. But what happens? In some cases, they repent, like in the story of Jonah with Nineveh. In some cases, the kings realize what, what they need to do. They go get the book of the law and they reinstate the practices of God. They do good. But in other cases, they don't repent. In other cases, they keep going and going and going. And... In the cases that they repent, it's not that the prophet was wrong. It's that the people listened to the proclamation of, of doom, and they allowed that to transform their lives, and they repented, and they went back to God, and things worked out for them. They had the decision, they had the ability to decide uh, to do that, just like you and I have the ability to look at the situation and decide to follow God. You know, We can commit our life to Christ, or we cannot. We have that decision within ourselves. God's foreknowledge does not necessarily determine the outcome of the thing. God can foresee all the paths which we might choose. And we have the freedom to choose which path we go down, and he knows the outcome uh, of each one we might choose to go down. Just like David could have chosen to stay there, he might have just said, well, Saul's coming no matter what, so let me just hunker down and fight her out. But he used God's foreknowledge that was revealed to him uh, through the ephod to go and to escape the city, and consequently Saul decided to not go ransack the city and to stay at home and take a vacation day. Uh, who knows what Saul did. So, what does all this mean for us? This means for us that the choice does not have to be between we have no free will because everything is foreknown and uh, there's you know we're basically just going to follow this path no matter what, uh, or... We don't have to go down the other road, which is God doesn't know the future at all. God chooses not to know the future, etc., 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 and uh, we have our own free will that way. No, there's this like middle option where God knows all of the outcomes, and we choose. Uh, we have the freedom to choose between the various paths, like David did in First Samuel chapter twenty-three. Now, this doesn't answer all the questions, does it? There's a lot of questions out there, like. What did it mean that, you know, these different prophets were picked before they were born? That Paul was predestined for his role? Uh, that God miraculously intervened in Paul's life to bring about his conversion? Why did God do that for Paul? And why did God not do that for Gandhi? <laughs> you know, whatever. We, we can ask all these questions and carry on the conversation again and again and again, and on and on and on. But I think this passage from 1 Samuel 23 is fairly compelling. The, God makes uh, the promise to David, you can ransack the city. And then likewise, you can save the city, I should say, that's being ransacked. And then he also says, yes, Saul is coming. And David uses that information in both cases to make a free choice as to what he would do. Would he trust in the strength of God and go help the cities or the city? Or in the second case, uh, would he <coughs> uh, not leave the city and decide to fight, even though he knew that the people would give him up? See, he had the decision uh, the ability to make the decision in both cases. Yeah. First Samuel 23, pretty interesting idea. There's probably some more thoughts that could be said uh, about this, and I'm sure you have your own questions about this text, as do I. And I don't know how this works. I still don't. And uh, I wish that I had the answers. But one thing that we have to learn to do as Christians is to learn to sit with the mystery and be happy with that. You and I aren't going to know how all this stuff works, even though we want to. We might see glimpses of it in 1 Samuel 23, but we might see glimpses of the other side, like in Ephesians chapter 1 or Romans chapter 9, that causes us to have all kinds of questions. What do we do with this information? Well, perhaps we do our best to allow the Spirit to work through us to bear the fruit of the Spirit, and knowing that God's going to work everything out, <laughs> and we don't have to be uh, to be knowledgeable of every little detail. And in fact, sometimes our lust for knowledge comes down to our need for being in control. We want to put God into a box and have everything properly defined and properly figured out and put it all in a book and label, label it systematic theology and say, look at me, I got all the answers. We, we want that so much, right? Look, that's just not something 
uh, that God has given us. In fact, that is the thing <laughs> uh, that God, Adam and Eve, uh, kicked out of the garden, so to speak, in, in Genesis chapter 3. That lust for knowledge, that idea that they wanted to be like God. And so many people fall into this trap of trying to be like God. And they come away disappointed because they don't have the answers. Because you're not going to get the answers. Like I said, we can have glimpses, but we're not always going to know. And so we have to learn to be content with the mystery. Well, that's hard to do, isn't it? Especially when you're raised in a situation where you thought that you could have all the answers. You know, I used to think, I'm not even kidding about this. Like, this might sound like a bit much, but I used to think that 18 to 22 years old or so, that I could basically answer any Bible question there was to be asked. I mean, I just thought that I had it figured out. I could debate anybody of any different denomination or tradition or perspective or whatever. I read debate books, and I read books defending my positions or whatever. And I say I read debate books. I mainly read the speeches of the person that I agreed with and glossed over or skipped altogether the speeches of the person I didn't agree with because I thought they were so ridiculous. (laughs) How arrogant that was, you know? How arrogant that was. But now I've got to learn. And it's so hard. And just to admit, I don't know it all. There's so much stuff I don't know. You just take one college class on theology, or you want to, you read one detailed, in-depth book about theology, and you're going, man, there is way more. There's way more out there than I thought that there was. And what that should do for all of us is give us a big dose of humility, because that's what we really need, right? Sit with the mystery. Yeah. And here I am making a podcast. (laughs) Oh, boy. Okay, let me tell you what's coming up the next few weeks. Next week, we have an episode uh, with Cheryl Bridges Johns on her book, Reenchanting the Text. She published it last year. I learned about this book from Brian Zond uh, through his social media and sermons and whatnot. It's a really excellent book. I enjoyed it. Uh, It's written from a Pentecostal perspective. So there's obviously going to be some stuff that you know, you might find it a little bit odd or strange as you read the book, as did I, but I loved it, and I think that you'd like it as well. Then the next week, we're going to be talking with Brian McLaren about his book, uh, Life After Doom. And then the following week, we're going to talk about Kyle Burke. Kyler Burke. Kyle Burke. What am I saying? I almost said Kyle Butt. Uh, Kyler Burke about his faith journey, uh, where he's been, where he's going, where he is, and hopefully that will inspire and encourage you. And if any of you want to share that kind of story, then I'd like to invite you to join us on the podcast as well. In season one of Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace, you might be episode six, you might be episode nine, who knows? Uh, But we can find out if you'll come and schedule a podcast with me. In fact, you can do that, by the way, by going to uh, danielr.net and clicking on the little thing there that says contact me. And if you do that, I'll send you a link to where you can schedule to come on the show and talk to me a little bit about your faith journey or maybe about a subject that you're interested in. Or you could even send that link uh, to someone who you love or who you love to read, who you love to listen to, and say, I want you to talk to this person, and I could talk to them too. Uh, So (laughs) I have the freedom uh, to to deny you entry, but if you would like to make the request, then that is available to you. Anyways, my friends, I hope you have enjoyed this little mini episode, episode one of season one of Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. And I will see you next week with Cheryl Bridges Johns and reexamining how we read the Bible. Peace.